Thanks for tuning into the FinTech Flow. I want to give you a heads up that if you are looking for CPE credits, this is eligible for one hour. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link in our description to get those credits. Hope you enjoy the episode. 2020 was spent talking about COVID. 2021 was spent talking about politics. 2022 was spent talking about international affairs. And now 2023 seems to be the year of economics and finance. <laughs> oh, man, when you summarize it that way, I'm concerned about the rest of the near year now. Yeah. What's so, next? I don't know. But yeah, between crypto, banks, the Fed, accounting standards, there's a lot of talk here, a lot of stuff to discuss. Last two weeks have been something else. So let's let's hop right to it. We got a lot to cover. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get flowing. So what's going on, everybody? This is the FinTech Flow. I am your co-host, Drew Carrick, the wrapping CPA and producer here at Flowcast Studios. And I'm Mike Whitmire, co-founder, CEO of Flowcast, inactive CPA. So uh, we've got a lot to get up to date on um, articles coming from all over the place here. And it's, it's just all different angles ever since this whole SVB thing. It just feels like the news has been nonstop, especially when it comes to accounting standards. Yeah. So uh, the first piece we have here, because we want to get right through this, is uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And uh, this was one of the the 10 point summaries that it had sent out in its email talking about First Citizens is buying veiled SVB. And I know there was a lot of discussion here about is is anybody ever going to buy it? Because nobody was there's no takers for a while. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, the feds can't run it forever. So I, I know at one point we were talking about, well, anything that we have, you know, virtual cards or something like that, which is issued to them, it might not exist anymore. So you really can't use it. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this sort of uh, change the game at all? Well, the, I mean, this is great. In, in my opinion, this means that SVB is going to continue to operate as a bank, which is great to see. Um, I'll tell you the little, little update on our side with kind of how we've progressed with Silicon Valley Bank. We did decide to, you know, stick with them for a good amount of our deposit. So we have we still have our operating account out of SVB. We're still working with them. We want to show a little bit of support for them. And particularly with the Fed backstopping depositors and everything, I think it became a less risky acquisition opportunity for someone like a, a first citizen. So I'm really excited about it. It means SVB gets to continue to operate as a bank. Everyone who works there gets to keep their jobs. They get to keep providing those more, you know, niche services for for entrepreneurs, VCs, startups as well, and everything. And it's just good for the banking ecosystem that we have more choice around that. So this was awesome to see this all all come to light. And you know, I'll say without the Fed stepping up and simply saying we will backstop depositors, I don't think this deal gets done. So them just having to just saying that literally made it so that so this deal could get done and leave everyone in a better position. Yeah, some of the interesting stats I think around that was so the deposit insurance fund is going to be taking a twenty billion dollar hit on this transaction, obviously because um, First Citizens Bank is buying SVB at a at a, at a nice at a nice discount. Mm -hmm. which is uh, which is always good. But the encouraging thing, like you said, is that the people get to keep their jobs. Everybody gets to still use the same portal that they got to access. So I'm wondering if at some point, do you think it would be something where eventually they would kind of convert things over? Another side tangent, not even part of the news, but impacted me directly is that uh, Schwab, I didn't realize, bought TD Ameritrade. Okay, I, yeah, I didn't know and about so that. So I have investments in, in both, and now everything's merging over into Schwab. You just, yeah, it's kind of annoying how that works. So I that'll be up to their management and how they want to approach it. But it, it seems like, at least personally, I would want to leave Silicon Valley Bank fairly standalone. It's a really good brand and a really valuable brand, and you want to keep that yeah. kind of as is. In terms of whether they merge operations and are you going to have one portal to log into, yeah, probably yeah. over time. That probably, that'll happen eventually, but I think they have, uh, that, that's a long road till we get there. But yeah, for all SVB users out there, I would, uh, or uh, for citizens, there might be some complications around logging into your portal at some point in the next couple of years. For sure. And and <laughs> for citizens, uh, their stock went uh you know, started uh, started going up pretty nicely. So yeah, well, what does that, what does that say about the acquisition when you could and, and presumably they got it done at a pretty good deal. Um, and yeah, it does seem like I, I hope FDIC doesn't get to, need to get tapped to make this deal done. It seems like there was enough liquidity, but we'll yeah. we'll see how it all shakes up. I think they basically just bought all the assets, <clears throat> just straight up. Uh, yeah, bought them. Mm -hmm. uh, so just uh, for anybody who's who's not seeing what we're seeing as far as what the actual paragraph regarding this was, it's the North Carolina based First Citizens. Bank shares, uh, one of the nation's largest regional banks, is buying the deposits, loans, and branches of SVB, whose collapse earlier this month sparked the panic that we talked about in our last episode. Uh, dramatic intervention by regulators meant to prevent depositors from fleeing smaller lenders, which was that backstop we talked about. And some $90 billion of SVB securities will remain in receivership. So this, uh, it helped stop chaos. Interesting. So yeah, I wonder if 
I wonder if it starts to be removed from receivership now that it's owned by a larger for citizens bank, how mm -hmm. much longer it has to be sitting there because yeah, it feels like if they're able to prove liquidity and it's now owned by a larger for citizens bank, it shouldn't need to be sitting in receivership anymore and the government can eject themselves from that and it can go back to, to operating. So really, yeah, really, when are they going to get out of that? That's an interesting You want to give us the, the quick lowdown on receivership? <clears throat> receivership is one. So as soon as there was the run on the Silicon Valley bank that occurred, the government takes it over and says, put in a receivership. We're not doing any more withdrawals. We're going to liquidate the bank and then people are going to get back, you know, their FDIC amount plus mm -hmm. whatever is left over from the depositors and, and everyone. So that's when it's owned by the government. It's basically dishing out the yeah. cash to everyone appropriately. Now that you don't have to dish cash out because the bank still operates, hopefully you don't have to go through the whole receivership yeah. process and we just like pretend this never happened sure. and move on with our lives. It's that would be of, really nice. For a pop culture reference, this is kind of uh, the, the federal version of a conservatory. Uh, the conservatorship with uh, Britney Spears, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> right, I right. Know, right? I, I, know, I, I own your life. Right? <laughs> Let's stay <laughs> oh, away I from see. that. Yes, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the words we like to use. Um, all right, so uh, the next piece here is interesting. Obviously, this happened over the last two weeks is the Federal Reserve uh, raised the interest rates. So that obviously sent the stocks overall uh, a little bit lower. So we went from 4.75% to 5%. So it's uh, not, a, not a huge, but it's still continuing to go up the yeah. interest rates. The, this is, I, in my opinion, a bad, a bad move. You know, there was heading into it, uh, heading into this Fed mood meeting ahead of any Silicon Valley bank news. I think the consensus was like a half a point rate hike, so 50, mm -hmm. uh, 50 points. Um, then there was some discussion around like, well, that's going to come down now that the banking issue has started. And I mean, up to the Fed meeting, people were starting to talk about, oh, well, they do no hike at all. And I, I was one of the wild people who thought they should just cut rates, like really just kind of shock and awe the system and be like, no, 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 we're cutting by a quarter point. That would have really made everyone excited and made a lot of this have, you know start to go away. And so I would hope they do something more extreme and cause like more of a visceral reaction. And then instead they just went for like a, eh, we'll only do a quarter point this time around, which yeah, clearly the market did not love uh, that right. that decision there. And I don't know yeah, how the how the heck are they going to get out of this? We'll see what they do with rates going forward. But yeah, market didn't love the initial response here. Yeah, for everybody, uh, we're looking at here a, a chart that's showing your March 2022 uh, to March 2023 stock performance of the uh, the index S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrials, and the NASDAQ Composite. Um, so after this move, each fell 1.6%. And I, I actually saw another chart somewhere too, which was just talking about progressively continuing on through October of just this trend continuing. When's, do you have any idea how, what is it, every quarter that they do? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do quarterly quarterly Fed meetings, right? The minutes come out afterwards mm -hmm. and everyone freaks out and the stock market adjusts accordingly. Um, and they'll, they'll continue to do that, but I, I genuinely, I, I know it's really interesting, right? The discussion is, hey, are we gonna keep jacking up rates to, right. to stop inflation? And different people have different opinions on the source of inflation here. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think by dropping rates, we're certainly gonna um, get rid of a lot of the bubbles that were created in asset classes, but I don't know if it's gonna be that impactful in terms of easing inflation. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense, like a, a lot of this free money going out, wasn't used to buy milk. It was used to buy <laughs> things we'll discuss later, sure. crypto, <laughs> NFTs that's on the docket for later, but mm -hmm. also invest in stock, buy housing, things like that. So yeah, yeah, this is, this is one where I think they're in a mess. They're kind of in this weird middle ground and not really making progress. And I just hope they at some point cut here and we go back to some semblance of normalcy. Yeah. This is the highest level for those uh, curious, the highest level since 2007, as far as the interest rates go. Yep. So we will see what happens going forward, but this is nine consecutive months of uh, going on the uppity up as the stocks go on the dippity dippity down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> so uh, speaking of of crypto related stuff, we have the FASB has been hard at work. Uh, so we this is from accounting today. Um, it's FASB releases exposure draft for cryptocurrency standards. Now, those curious, an exposure draft is a document published by FASB to solicit public comment on a proposed new accounting standard. So it's not official, it's just proposed. Interested parties are invited to express their opinions to minimize any unintended consequences before whatever is being recommended becomes law. That's a really good concept. Just That's a great idea. I, I think it's a brilliant idea. Like go, go FASB. There yeah. we go. How are you guys going to react? I mean, who would have thought these guys are overthinkers? I just want to skip forward to this slide for a second. These guys are overthinkers. We're looking at a, a boardroom <laughs> from 2017 of a, of a FASB boardroom, which is just like a square table. I don't really think I see those too often. Hmm. 
Um, and everybody's just sitting around. And I mean, there's not a computer in sight if you look. <laughs> You're right. It's all paper. Oh, my gosh. You got you got 15 people around a square here with paper. And I don't, yeah, yeah, that was a very old school meeting. But uh, these are the folks talking about crypto and NFTs yeah. now. Yeah. Right. I mean, I could just I just imagining like what they're sitting across from each other and they're like, Mr. Smith from uh, Minnesota. What do you, how do you feel about the crypto standards right now? <laughs> like they're, they're too complex. The, cri the crypto. What's the crypto? What's the crypto? Uh, so do you want to take a, just a read what the article actually uh, yeah, states here, the sure. first paragraph? I'm, I'm not good at reading things out loud, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> All right. So the Financial Accounting Standards Board released an exposure draft that proposed rules on accounting for and disclosing information on crypto assets. It's the first time the standards body has produced a formal proposal governing such assets. However, FASB uh, <clears throat> said stakeholders have been saying the current way that crypto assets are generally accounted for, which treats them as an indefinite, uh, indefinite lived intangible asset, does not provide investors, lenders, creditors, and other capital market participants with decision useful information. That's really important because that's what we're trying to do is provide people mm -hmm. with information they can make decisions on. So yeah, big, big issue to have there. All right. The paragraph wraps up with such a treatment reflects only the decreases, not the increases in the value of crypto, crypto assets and the financial statements until they are sold. So this is like, that's the key sentence. This mm -hmm. is like mark to market only down. Yep. No, it's, it's really, and we've actually been talking about this because at Flowcast, we've done a lot of content on crypto yeah. and NFTs, just like webinars and stuff over the years. And this one always struck me as something that I don't know in what world you would ever think this makes sense to classify it that way. You know, it's a liquid asset. It goes up and downs. Right. It goes up and down. Very similar to like the um, par value of the mm. bonds at the banks we've been discussing. Those should be valued both ways, you know, on a pretty regular basis. Same should apply for, for cryptocurrency since it is so easy to exchange for U.S. dollars. We have the technology <laughs> to you know it's, it's how automatic. much. It's <laughs> automatic. You can automate it. <laughs> like this isn't one of those things where it's like, all right, we're going to have to spend a couple you know, weeks at the end of the quarter and try to figure out how much our stuff is worth. I mean, it, in real time, we know every second. I mean, you know when you try to buy a stock and all of a sudden it locks up for a second because it's like, oh, sorry, too late. You got to refresh your page. Yeah. If, if there's any accounting work that could be automated, this, this feels like a very, very easy one. And same yeah. with, uh, I remember we were looking at the meme a couple weeks weeks ago with accountants having to mark to market and being concerned about the guys like smoking the cigarettes. Yeah. It's not that much work to calculate the fair value difference, book a journal entry, and let's move on with our lives from there. It feels very reasonable. So I'm glad to see they're taking a look at this and <clears throat> doing it through this exposure draft uh, move, I think makes a lot of sense because then, yeah, people who really know a bunch about this topic can opine on it and it's collaborative with, uh, with FASB. So looks good. It's crazy that when I left auditing, this wasn't even a thing. Like there was never, I remember doing the investment cycle. Like I can imagine how beefy the investment cycle of an audit must be now when you have these, I guess they're level three in, uh, well, well, no, they're, they are identifiable level two. Uh, I don't even know. I don't, I, don't know. Know. I, don't I don't know. I have level, no idea. I don't know what level they're on. That's for sure. <laughs> but you know, um, so then, uh, just for, for, for the, for the audience here, the proposed standard would apply to crypto assets that Meet the definition of intangible asset as defined in the FASB Accounting Standards Codification Master Glossary. Do not provide the asset holder with enforceable rights to or claims on underlying goods, services, or other assets are created or reside on a distributed ledger based on blockchain technology, are secured through crypto, cryptography, are fungible, and are not created or issued by the reporting entity or its related parties. You, know, you can't make your own crypto and then, right. Okay. And then okay. So that, that's for the avoiding the FTX, creating their own coins, and sure. valuing that type of situation. Yeah. That, all that, all yeah. that makes sense to me. And I mean, yeah, it feels like what this is going to shake out is we're just going to treat it like any other kind of currency. And yeah. It, which makes sense to me. And it's good. And so we uh, on the line of crypto. The next level of crypto is, of course, using crypto to then buy more crypto or NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should take a second to explain NFTs sure. to the audience. Would you like to do that? Or do you think I should take a stab at doing it? Uh, well, an NFT is a non-fungible token. All right. Uh, it's... I'll, I'll try to do the layman's, like, if you were to try to figure this out, how do you explain, explain it? Explain to a five-year-old, do that do that whole thing. Yeah, how do you explain, what, like, what's the soul? <laughs> what is your soul? <laughs> it's deep. So are, yeah. so are NFTs. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, and uh, essentially, you're... you're purchasing a virtual art piece or some sort of, it represents something else. So you can buy a, a stake in a, in a piece of music. It's a, it's a digital asset, if you will. We think a kid knows what a five-year-old knows what a digital asset is. Like, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I, I it, NFTs have perplexed me forever. I, I conceptually get them, the theoretically get them. And, uh, in, in, me in mechanism, I have no idea how the heck this is like, because you can't hold it, right? So you can buy a moment in history, which seems bizarre. 
And I was like, well, you don't have the physical card. You just have the, 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 the GIF. Yeah. GIF, GIF of, of the moment of, I don't know which one it is. Bartolo yeah. Colon's home run. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's one of the ones where I was like, wow, I really wish I had that moment, but I'm like, I could just watch it on YouTube. That's a but good you one. You can that, literally own it. That's a good call out. I think though, I think I remember that one in San Diego while he was on the Mets, he went, mm -hmm. he went deep. Yeah. First time in his career. Um, so, okay, my understanding NFTs here is you have, it's a it's a digital asset. Yeah, so it's not something you can physically hold. However, there's a limited number of them. And that's mm -hmm. that's where the value lies is really like that ability to say, I'm the only one who has this. So <clears throat> you buy a piece of art, perhaps the person who created the digital art only wants to issue 25 of these licenses, or maybe they only do one. Then that's a non-fungible token NFT. They sell that to you on the blockchain. So the blockchain is how we we stamp it with certain numbers. We know okay, this trend. You know, Drew owns this piece of art that was created by this person. Purchase it on this date for this much money. Then that can get resold down the line. One of my favorite things about it is actually this is a really cool mechanism. The original artist. So let's say they make it. Let's say you pay a thousand dollars for it. The next person pays two thousand dollars for it. So you would get a thousand dollar gain, but actually in this world now, the original artist also gets a portion of that gain. Mm. So it's this royalty, it's this perpetual royalty is how a lot of the contracts are structured, which I think is a really cool thing yeah. for like the creator of this, of this art. If it continues to go up over time, yeah. you still get a little bit of that upside. That's a pretty yeah. cool, pretty cool setup to have. Uh, but another one that might make uh, a little more sense is actually we hilariously cover it in PBC when the IT guys are yeah. in the metaverse, right? And they're doing like a real estate tour. That is a that is going to be a thing. So for example, in the metaverse will be created, there'll be some city where you buy houses and only rich people can buy the houses. And then you can go hang out with the other rich people who have houses in the metaverse <laughs> area. And the way you're going to prove that you own that house is because it's an NFT that you purchased. How are you going to prove that you purchased that? It's going to be on the blockchain mm -hmm. and then no one else can move into your house. And our IT guys in PBC will own their house. Uh, it's an NFT through the blockchain. Yeah. And then whenever they want to slap on their VR goggles, and go vacation or whatever they're going to do, they have the keys to that house, basically. And, and in their house, of course, they can have the art piece, which is an NFT in and of itself that they get to yep. hang on the wall, and they're the only one that has that. Yeah, and then they bought the Board A Yacht Club one, and that's mm -hmm. over on that wall, and that gives them access to other things as yeah. well. So, yeah, NFTs are, are, are weird. I can kind of get the the stance around it, especially as a guy who collects baseball cards. Like yeah. I, I get that appeal, um, but I also don't understand when it's like a picture right. <laughs> that you can just copy. <laughs> so I am on that whole thing. You can just screenshot a JPEG. The, the, the technical <laughs> mechanism behind it is the, is the interesting part. Cause it's like, okay, well on your phone, you have like a digital credit card or something like that. Um, this is, I'm showing you the NFT. It's just this thing that I have on my phone that floats in this cloud blockchain thing, but it's mine. Yeah, And it's just like a weird concept because you'll never be able to hold it. Now, I do like the idea of when it's tied to something. And that's kind of what this talks about here. This is an article from Accounting uh, Today accounts encouraged by the proposed NFT rules. Again, proposed. So we have time to think about this uh, and evaluate it. But I, was there an exposure? Or I guess they would propose it and then dra do an exposure it, draft and then make it available. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you want to take a, take a stab at reading this one? All? Sure. Yeah. Hey, I'm practicing <laughs> my reading out loud today. All right. Proposed IRS rules for non-fungible tokens are seen as a good first step by some in the accounting profession. Uh, accounting professionals in the space, indicating the agency is finally taking these assets seriously. A non-fungible token or NFT is a digital asset that represents ownership of something unique, like a piece of art, music, or a collectible. When someone buys an NFT, they are not buying the physical item, but the right to claim ownership of it. In this sense, it operates like a digital certificate of ownership stored on a blockchain. Um, so I'm, I'm really encouraged that they are starting to look at this. I, I will, you know, this isn't like they come up with rules, but Credit where credit's due, NFTs have only been a thing for like 18 months really at this point. And in the world of accounting to respond to like a new technology that quickly to at least be discussing this, this feels like they're moving faster than they generally do. If you think about crypto, for example, mm -hmm. an exposure draft just went out. I heard about Bitcoin in 2008, nine. It's been a long time, right? Wow. It's It's been available. Like when we started Flowcast, man, so much so much Bitcoin was being purchased and it was uh, like, it, it was, it's been around for a while and they're just getting around to exposure drafts around it. NFTs were, I don't know, all my post COVID time morphs together now, but it feels like <laughs> roughly 18 months ago is when this started. So they're, they're, they're on it, which is really cool. And this will be a really interesting exercise in how do you account for these things? Because like we were saying, a lot of it is digital. That's what the article talks about, but it doesn't talk about how some of it is this mix of, you can also get certain experiences in the real world, like sure. with, uh, Board Ape Yacht Club 
not only do you get the picture, you can put it as your Twitter profile or whatever you want to do with that picture and show it off. But I guess you also get rights to like exclusive parties or meetups mm -hmm. or something with other people who own these things. And so there's a way, you know, that could be a different way of valuing these things. And I don't know how you value the opportunity to go to a party with other you know, with Steph Curry, who owns an NFT or anything. I don't know how the hell you value that, but fa fascinating exercise should be a good, should be yeah. a good time for uh, FASB to figure out. Yeah, I think it's really cool. That's that's the key element here where I actually see there being values. I think previously, we the first 12 months was just this chaos of people treating it like the shitcoin boom of crypto, which a lot of those shitcoins have basically filtered out at this point where they're just yeah. kind of floating around a couple pennies. Uh, and then you still have like the staples that will become part of our regular ecosystem a regular economy. The NFTs were the same thing. It was almost, it started off like the like the tulip boom of the 1800s, where it was just like, it, it's nothing. It's literally just a JPEG and we're assigning a value to it and everybody wants it. And then people are like, it, it's literally just this picture. There's no actual value. But when businesses and individuals and artists start tying something to it, like by owning a piece of this album, you have pre-access to the music. So you'll get it a month before everybody else and only you can listen to it through using your token as your credential to get in right and a, and a really cool situation which i actually consider this um back in on long island there was a bar that created a, a, a i don't know how many they created but i think it was kind of unlimited which kind of doesn't disproves the whole point of the value of how much could it be worth but it was like 300 dollars, and it was like a by having it you had access to cut the line at the bar every time you wanted to go so you didn't have That's to cool. you yep. didn't have to pay a cover and mm -hmm. you get access to the back lounge area that uh, everybody else doesn't, and you get to, to skip the line. Okay. So there was an actual tangible value to that owning that NFT, yeah. which I think is a really cool concept. Yeah, and I think you can, because there's the scarcity value, which that clearly doesn't have if they're selling unlimited, but there's still clearly a value to being able to cut the line and go to like the, yeah. the you know, wherever, if you get better service yeah. in the back or whatever, that, that kind of thing. So that that's an yeah. interesting use of one as well yeah. um it's a mecha it's a mechanism right and so uh the, to further elaborate but, on but, this, but it's yeah. funny because we're just talking about how crypto it's so easy to value you know the market all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff how do you value what is it worth to be able to cut the line every saturday if you want to go do that or how do you value like this board ape yacht club thing when it's not a liquid market and there aren't like a one of one mm -hmm. is very difficult to value it doesn't sell all the time so how do you actually value that like mm -hmm. and, and these swings i'm gonna assume are gonna be pretty wild in terms of fair market value around all this What's what's really interesting, I heard this crazy hot take. Uh, it was a video talking about how art's just used as a shelter for rich people to avoid taxes. That's not a hot take. That's just true. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess sometimes the truth are hot takes. Well, I, was just like, I created this JPEG picture. I uploaded it. And uh, somebody said it's worth this much. Or I, I don't know, relational transaction. You know, oh, it's, this is worth $10 million. I'm going to go donate it to that museum. And now I get to write off the whole thing. And it costs five bucks to make on Fiverr. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, you sell. Yeah, yes. yes. So the interesting the thing art, about the art this, trade is uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we we will we'll avoid getting too deep into that. But uh, the the actual proposal here is that under a look through analysis, an NFT is treated as a collectible if the NFT is associated right or asset falls under the definition of collectible in the tax code, which currently has, for example, a gem is considered to be collectible under Section 408M of the tax code. So that means an NFT that certifies ownership of a gem is collectible as well. So if there is actually the physical thing collectible okay. that that's tied to. So this is what we're talking about, where there's actually some valuable in in person, in this corporeal realm physically there. If the NFT represents a right to a plot of land in a virtual metaverse, like mm -hmm. we're talking about, oh, there we go. Boom. since the plot is not collectible under the terms of 408M, the NFT is not, a collect is not collectible either. So it can't be treated as a collectible on the tax code because you can't actually collect it. And I'm, I'm assuming, unless they decide to change the tax code to include in collectibles things that you can't physically collect, I'm assuming that in 408M, there is actual language that states you have to be able to hold it or touch it or something with your senses. This is going to be nuts. Yeah. <clears throat> watching this guy just come out. I'm excited to see this progress. We got to keep covering this on For future sure. on future episodes. Absolutely. Any, we'll keep goes. we'll and, keep everybody updated. I mean, holy crap, you just went on a rabbit hole. The amount of like little like ifs, thens, mm -hmm. and all this stuff are going to be nuts. Yeah. Oh, it's it's okay. a new world we're dealing with. So I want to finish up this uh this up to date section with uh, one of our favorite topics, which is SOC2 uh in Zen Ledger. This is a Zen Ledger is the leading platform for crypto taxes and forensic accounting. This is uh Basically, just a you know an announcement that got made. Zen Ledger is SOC two certified. All right. Well, yeah. shout out to Zen Ledger. Here's your free advertisement on the fintech flow. Yeah. Good stuff. Congratulations. Getting SOC two <laughs> certified is no easy feat. I'll tell you that. Uh, right now, having to go through it personally and 
it's pretty awesome that a company focused on crypto is going the mm-hmm. you know real grown up SOC two route and everything. I wonder if it's a type one or a type two report. True. I uh, so it's a ch- it's type one. Type it's one. Achieved. Okay. Yeah, hey, six more months. One. Just stay compliant. You'll get that type two report. Don't so, worry. So I just wanted to, as as somebody who's deep down the rabbit hole into SOC compliance, mm-hmm. you know wh- who you know who is SOC two compliance necessary for, and you know why is SOC two compliance so important? So SOC two compliance. I mean, it's a it's an audit of the security of your application. It's how you operate internally. Do the appropriate people have access rights to the right systems and all this kind of stuff? What kind of changes could be made to the t- technology behind the scenes? Things like that. And it's to give uh, customers basically comfort that your software is working as you promise it to work and that it's going to do things just properly. So, for example, FTX, my assumption is FTX did not have a SOC 2 type 2 report. And one of the issues they had within their code base is they had a backdoor for transferring money between the hedge fund and the crypto exchange. And if you go through a SOC 2 exercise, that's going to get caught. And that's going to be like, no, you know how in the terms of, of service you say you're not doing any of this stuff? Well, that's not happening through your technology. And so it's kind of bridging, like, what are the terms of service and the rules with how is it, everything actually operating behind the scenes? And then what are the ethics of your organization? So what they've done here is they got SOC 2, they got their type 1 certification, which the audit firm comes out does an assessment of how you operate today and what everything looks like. And if they're cool with how you're structured and operating today, you'll get your type one report. Six, uh, then for your type two, they'll come back out like six, nine, 12 months later, I think just a little dependent. Um, And then they're gonna audit back over the last six, nine, 12 months, however long it's been since they gave you the type one report. They're gonna make sure you are in fact operating in that environment still. So they'll do some sample selection, test some different things, and then you get your type two report a little bit later, and then you just have to remain compliant, and that type two gets issued you know, every year from there. This is specifically for SaaS or some software companies, right? Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if that's the only requirement. That's the world I'm in. I know right. I've always had to deal with SOC reports sure. and getting that uh, taken care of, but uh, yeah, I think it would apply to anyone who is building software yeah, I think, this is, I think SaaS companies. Because this is different from just, you know, you do your systems of controls as part of your regular financial statement audit, but that's, yeah. I guess, a micro version. This is the expanded version of that section. Yeah, the, this is, so SOC is, I would argue, more IT, it's, it's more IT focused than it is financial statement. There's SOX, SOX, yeah. <laughs> Sarbanes-Oxley, and yeah. then there's SOC. I don't even know what SOC stands for, but SOC, that's what we're talking about here. And even within the world of SOC, there's SOC 1 and SOC 2. Yeah. <laughs> and then within each of those, you have a type one and a type two report. So I've learned way too much about SOC reports over the years. But uh, yeah, SOC and SOX are not not necessarily related, just sound very similar. Yep. A, the, the official, uh, per the AICPA, SOC 2 compliance is a set of standards developed by the AICPA that measures an organization's ability to maintain a secure and confidential environment for customer data. So this includes, I think, even buildings access, right? <laughs> of making sure that yeah, you know how we have to badge in, badge out mm-hmm. all the time? Yeah, that's that's for SOC 2. It's literally, I mean, it's stuff like, for example, we have, I think within Flowcast, there's a way to access the database and every company needs that somebody to be able to manually access it. So they're like, okay, if something breaks, you need to ma- access that. What are the controls around that? To give you a sense of how wild that gets, there's a secret room inside of Flowcast headquarters that I have never even been in. I haven't seen this room before. There's a separate key badge for it. Someone needs to go in. There are like five people at the company who have this badge. They would access it. As soon as they exit the badge, all the cameras would start recording who's in the room. We literally have cameras watching what's going on in the room, but also a camera on the keyboard to be able to watch what this person's typing in real time and have it all recorded. So if they're going in and logging into anything sketchy, doing anything shady, we have that tracked right there. So preventative, or Mm -hmm. I I guess uh, it would be a detective control around that. But there's just so much, it's like, if you want to go make a change to anything, it's yeah. like, you got to, it's like getting into Fort Knox to make it happen within Flowcast. So yeah, it covers, in a lot of the world, it is about security and data governance. That that, that really is the main focus of it. It would be really funny if somebody's like finger slips up for a second and it just like all of a sudden the doors come down, it shuts down, the lasers are all there, like remain in where you are. The police have been alerted. That's <laughs> kind of, I, yeah, maybe it might for all I right. know. I don't know. Our, we're, don't we're, go in that very, room. We're very good at compliance, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's what if that's what happens. So uh, moving on here to have you read it, we'd like to take a look at uh, what posts have been popping on, uh, popping off All in the right. accounting and fintech subreddits. So uh, here we've got a, a post in accounting from Wacko Kid Wilder, and this is uh, it's titled "Taking Life Control C Control V at a Time." 
or I like to say taking life, one control C, one control V at a time. And it's a post from a job posting, right? <laughs> where, where basically there was a job posting put online for a cost accountant. Uh, we won't go into the details of what the job entails, but in the security role and expectations, <laughs> I'll read this one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Uh, this is what the expectations are in the job description. So if you're an applicant, this is what you'll be looking at. HR, not sure what to put here. No direct security roles other than keeping their own credentials and info secure and general confidentiality regarding any sensitive, non-public information about the company's operations. That's a bullet point of one of the things that... <laughs> it's like they wrote the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> but for some reason structured it. Is. That's really great. I mean, this just, it brings it to question, like how productive is society? How many people are just control C and control v their way through everything? Are, 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 are people really, because this, this involves just some cognitive thinking. You know, if, if I'm HR, I send you, hey, I need a job description for the cost account. Let me know what, you know, here's the template, fill this out. They filled it out, they sent it back and they put in there this note. If it was me, I would have highlighted it because that's what we do. You know, <laughs> if we don't know something as accountants, we highlight it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then at least it, it makes it stand up. HR didn't review it at all. They just copied the template and popped it into the job description. You know, this reminds me of is when we put in our application for um, to hire a studio coordinator, mm -hmm. we put in there a uh, preferred ability to slap the bass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and cause we're looking for a good to where it's like, yeah. well, I, pl I play the drums and Alex sings and, uh, you know, Josh play, you know, could be, could play all the instruments. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Glassman could play the bass, uh, could play some guitar and he could play saxophone and whatnot, clarinet. So we had all these components. We we're like, we really need a bass player. So let's put that in there. As and, a, in the nice to haves or whatever, yeah, whatever nice section that would be. <laughs> uh, and, and then and we got pinged by Addie you know, and she's like, are you guys serious about this? <laughs> we're like, nah, did, you did you leave it? She took, did she cut it? Yeah, we cut it. Okay. Well, that's Addie. She's yeah. very, uh, yeah. a lot of attention to detail. <laughs> with Addy, I'm not that surprised. Well, you could also call into question just their control C skills. Like why not copy something from another job description that you have or quickly Google it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I don't think many people are sitting down literally writing all these bullets from scratch. Like yeah. I'm sure you probably hired someone else, just copy paste it from that job description, not write a note that took longer than pasting from the appropriate source. I mean, that that, that kind of just talks about how we've progressed as a society in, in job roles is like, it used to be frowned upon to Google things. Now it's a matter of like, is that your skill? And they may created a board game about that where it's like rather no Googling, we're playing trivia, no Googling. And then they created a board game where the whole point is to Google and it's who's a better Googler. Yeah. Well, dude, like we were, what was it? We're trying to find some article a week or two ago and we were discussing it over Slack and I'm like, oh, I can't find where this is. And within five minutes, you guys sent me the article. You had found it. Oh, it was when we were prepared. We were like, oh, is this a confidential piece of information oh, that yeah, we're yeah, about yeah. to share? <laughs> yeah. And I was freaking out. And yeah, it turns out it wasn't because you guys found it within a couple minutes. Right. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, the bank chart, the bank chart of all the, uh, all like, the banks and how much kids are good deposits. At, those kids are good at Google. I'm falling behind right now. <laughs> Same <laughs> deal. This is an interesting thought. Okay, so is this like creating two ends of a spectrum where you're either not working very well and doing everything super manually and like typing stuff and doing this, or are you just so lazy that you're totally automating everything and there's like, no, like, are we losing people in the middle of that? I mean, I just hope there's enough people that still actually have the skills of what needs to get done. Uh, I mean, I, some of the things I think you can just get by with, but you're going to lack, I don't know, this is, it's a really weird thing. I think we're having a growing group of people that are just mailing it in, just control scene, control being, hey, I get a paycheck or whatever, it'll, they can't afford to fire me anyway because yeah. nobody else wants to work, so whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you have people who are just like automated. They don't they don't care either. They're not really invested, but they know that it's important for them to look good or to just be efficient so that they have to do less work. So those are the control seat, the, the proficient automators who don't go the extra mile, but they're just getting the work done and they, they kind of kick it the rest of the day because mm -hmm. the other people are just so lazy and struggle to figure it out or they're not as skilled at automating the stuff. And then you have the actual people that know what the heck they're doing. And that's a smaller and smaller group of people. It's becoming smaller, <laughs> yeah. So uh, in in the same in the same realm of that, this was um, not necessarily a Reddit post. I'm sure it's been posted on Reddit, but it was uh, professional emailers unite. This is from Work Retire Die, which is a an Instagram account, and uh, we're gonna play a little video here. And it, this is titled "What It's Like in 90% of Office Jobs," and this has to do exactly with uh, what's funny here and whatnot. Yo, you know what's so sick is I went to college for four years and um, I've kind of spent my entire adult life emailing one group of people about what the other group of people is doing um, and like back and forth. And then um, I get yelled at by both sides, kind of like no matter what happens. Um, and I don't like really make or contribute anything. Um, 
And like, it's, it's like so, 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 so fun. I like, it's so fun. So, yeah. What's interesting is coordinating human beings might be one of the jobs that's not automated. That is a really good point. Oh, that's disturbing. We talk, we, one of our favorite terms that we like to talk about is the administrative burden. <laughs> yeah. So you can make tools to like make this easier and track progress and help manage projects. Right. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, this guy who hates this job is going to be necessary for driving things and actually getting them done. That's sort of disturbing. It, it's, you know, people joke about like companies being inflated and having all these unnecessary jobs and as you grow as a company, just the administrative burden literally just keeps getting bigger. You need more people to just coordinate between people. And there's, like we talked about before, there's a fewer group of people actually doing their real work. And it's more so, and I mean, accounting is kind of like that. Like as you become more complex, you need people just keeping records of what the heck's going on. And that's why a lot of people just view, you know, you're just an expense. You're not making any money for the company, but it's a very necessary administrative burden to keep track of even mm -hmm. though it's not necessarily producing anything it's kind of saving on the back end this is a pitch for working at a startup <laughs> by the way you're you're not doing as much project management it's, right. it's the work you're doing is is actually producing things of value for the company and for customers and and employees and everything and it's just like this is yeah when your full-time job th this is a brutal full-time job that i can't imagine is very fulfilling in mm. life and is not the best use of money for the company that is paying this person yeah. to do this work so i don't know pitch for a startup man and <laughs> another you, plug and for joining the, a startup the really difficult thing i'd wonder here is like how do you motivate people because it's it's still something like you said we can't automate it somebody has to do it and nobody really is like passionate about emailing back and forth between people, but it's something that does need to get done. And it's not something that a company is like, this isn't a difficult skill. Mm -hmm. It's just something that people don't want to do. But I wonder if it's almost like, you know, how I've, a lot of the times they referenced auditing being like, you're doing monkey checklist work. You're just getting paid a premium to do the stuff that nobody else wants to do, which is go through this thing. And obviously you do need to have context. We talked about critical thinking, being able to take it a step further than just the checklist in front of you. But for a lot of people, a lot of jobs are just, checking the boxes and I mean they're a it's a project manager they're going to put together a checklist of things that needs to get done for this project to get taken care mm -hmm. of um and yeah maybe the, the, I'm sure there's some difference between the the how the best project managers handle it and how the mediocre ones you know I would imagine okay how, how about this the best product manager or project managers are really project leaders they're inspiring mm -hmm. their teams to get stuff done get it done quickly efficiently and on time and, and done well also so maybe that's it it's like yeah, yeah what de what determines a good project manager in the future, it's going to be people, maybe not with this attitude where they hate their job and think about, oh, this sucks. Maybe it's more like, hey, this could be really impactful for the company if I rally these teams to make this happen. Mm -hmm. If we get it done by XYZ date, it's going to be this great for us. So let's go team, yeah. rah, rah, more. <laughs> like, if you had a little more of that mentality, that's yeah. how you're best at that job. Don't, don't think as a manager, think like a leader. Yeah, well, this go. guy's saying it's so, so, so fun. So yeah, yeah. I think he's really loving it. But I do think <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a skill. <laughs> this <laughs> is like, a, I'm waiting for like in a, in a month, it's going to be like the follow up where you got laid off. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> like, so that job. <laughs> it was so much more fun than me not making any money. <laughs> but I think there's a real opportunity for individuals to kind of go into leadership training or understand how to motivate employees. Because again, everybody has a different niche. Some people have grand ambitions. Some people want the, the as I like to call it with some of my friends, the, a nice little life. Mm -hmm. And it, there's no right or wrong. It's just yep. whatever the one that you're kind of cut out for. But you have to understand what motivates people. And if you can tap into that, I know a woman I took a leadership course with, uh, it was it's called The Hero's Journey, and it was all about, it was a year-long course on how to motivate, how to lead people and and organize. She was a, she ran a cleaning service. And how do you motivate people working under you to just be part of your growing cleaning service? And I don't, I really don't know the ins and outs of how it works, because at the end of the day, you're just, you got to go clock in, you got to clean a house, you got to clean toilets, the whole the corners, everything. But she found a way to utilize these skills to just like inspire people. So you're not just doing the task that's in front of you, but you're contributing to the organization, you're contributing to the group, you feel invested. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think just identifying that motivating factor is the key there too. There, there are ways to do it. And I, I guarantee you that having a negative attitude about mm -hmm. what you're doing in your job is not an inspiring way to do it. Yeah. So I, I, I would say, you know, you can have this mentality if you don't like your job, that's fine. But I would not 
talk about it this way yeah. or post on social media about it because some of the people you work with are going to see this and that's really demotivating for everybody involved and just not like why, why put out that kind of negativity yeah. for no good reason just silently dislike your job but get it done mm -hmm. and that's fine and if you hate what you do so much go do something else that's yeah. like the reality of it and again joke like you still a decent job market you can go do that if you really hate what you do so much but I don't know. Getting sick of this negativity yeah. around around this kind of stuff. Well, good laugh at least. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, talking about the stuff that's getting ridiculous. This is uh, this is from Reddit. This is from fin. Uh, this is in the fintech uh, Reddit subsection. This is from uh, Eugene HP, and we're looking at a picture of a one button checkout getting crazy. You you have the options, of course, your normal things, right? Is this Which, real? Are these all real? Th that was the thing that I was going to wonder. I I mean, I, this it could very well be photoshopped, but we're looking at a list here of drop down express checkout. You know, everything now is like try to get you to not have you have the least number of clicks in order to buy something. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the key. Have least number of clicks to get there. So we created this one step checkout. You have your shop pay. Uh, you have your Apple Pay. You have your PayPal. Then they added this thing, Affirm, which can, you know, that I've seen that around. It allows you to do payment plan. If you want to, like, buy something for $40 and do it in four monthly payments of $10. Hey, Affirm's awesome. You need to speak positively about Affirm. Oh, no, they're right? great. They're great. No, they're <laughs> great. It's, it's a great concept. It's yeah. just uh, people, I mean, $40, okay. You know, you and Klarna is the same thing, right? It's like. Might you can get these like micro loans to purchase something? Pay, you know, I'm buy I'm, now, pay I'm assuming whatever, so. Whatever I, I like the Amazon Pay because I have everything linked through that, so it's just an easy access. But now you start getting some crazy stuff on here, which I don't know if this is legit or not. But we got Facebook Pay and we got Starbucks. That's pay. where okay, so I, it's real until there is. Are those actual things? I mean, there's Facebook crypto, right? I mean, you could buy Facebook coins. I remember in Farmville getting coins, right? And Starbucks Pay. I mean, I. I guess if you I link it through your app, it's single sign-on. It's called MetaPay now. I, I'm on Google here looking at stuff. I mean, anywhere that has your payment information in it, it's basically like single sign-on, but for single checkout. <laughs> wow, it is a thing? Okay. Starbucks Pay. Is this really Starbucks is becoming a bank all of a sudden? We're finding out what's going on, everybody, whether or not this is truly a trolling effort here. And we're going to start seeing Dunkin' Donuts pay. Your next thing you're going to have of 500 pay options, depending on what store you stop. Uh, whatever store it is, stop, stop it's too much. I'm wondering at what point we can limit the number of these that are made available to somebody. And yeah, I do. Then just like macro wise, these uh, these deferred payment things like the Affirms and Clarnas of the world, mm -hmm. I would love, I'm really curious to see how that shakes out with the economic impact in yep. the long run. Are people racking up a ton of debt? Right. And I don't know where that debt's contemplated in your consumer and your credit report. Is that submitted mm -hmm. as like credit card debt? Is that consumer debt that we're contemplating as part of our broader macroeconomic sure. picture? This is a whole thing where, you know, I was like scratching my head a couple of years ago, like what are the pending bubbles? And this was one that crossed my mind is like this kind of pay later stuff in these micro loans. But yeah, the anyway. micro loans thing is that, that's the interesting part. Cause like I said, this is a $40 thing that you could make four monthly payments of $10 each. And for me, I would only do it if I just like, for some reason for my budgeting, I wanted to make it even. Otherwise it's like, I could, I can have, I can find 40 bucks to, to just pay this up front. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if there are things where the people are actually doing this consistently to the point where that debt is racking up. So I've been watching, I've been watching a couple of videos of this guy on YouTube, his name, Caleb, I think it's hammer. Mm -hmm. And he does like personal financial statement audits for people. Okay. And to see some of the things that people are buying with these is like, whoa, really? You got to buy like a, you know, your new controller for your PS5 and that's going on Klarna, like Afterpay and stuff. And so just like watching something that, first of all, shout out to this guy. He makes great content. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, super interesting. We could maybe link him in the, the sure. comment or whatever, but um, really fascinating stuff. And yeah, seeing like people deploy this type of micro debt or whatever, however you want to think about it, like pretty frequently, got me, got me a little more worried about the overall, the underlying situation there. I think uh, that's a good idea for some video mm -hmm. content to start doing uh, audits of other stuff. Yeah, That'd well, this one's fun. really cool, like personal finances. Yeah. It's like literally going through, he goes through people's bank statements and credit card reports, and mm -hmm. they sit there and talk through it one-on-one, -on -one, and it's like a combination of an audit slash therapy session. <laughs> it's it's, it's good I content. pretty good at that. I, I, yeah, I yeah. recommend it. <laughs> Very cool. So now, uh, as we're getting concerned with how many options there are to pay and how much debt's being racked up in microloans, that's concerning. Uh, just going to touch on this because it's not necessarily financially impactful. However, it is technologically impactful and mm -hmm. you can't avoid how much TikTok has blown up over the course of the last couple of years. I remember 2020 was like the year of TikTok as well. Mm -hmm. I would say that and just everybody got on TikTok. And so we have here a picture of the CEO of TikTok. And uh, in the last week, he was over in Congress 
And House lawmakers grilled TikTok CEO about potential Chinese government influence over the platform. Uh, this is one of those security things where they say basically, apparently in the terms and conditions, Beijing has access to all the data on your phone through TikTok because by agreeing to TikTok, you're agreeing to let them access not just the information on TikTok or cross platforms, but literally everything. And that's a scary mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. And you talk about data security and compliance and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I think that. when you agree to the terms of service, they, there's access to everything on your phone, right? It's just like every app, everything that's going on, you get access. And I think the argument is, well, that's how we make our algorithm so good is because we know so much about you. That's mm -hmm. why the algorithm serves you up such good content just for you. And it's like, okay, but yeah, that's, I don't know at what point privacy is worth the, yeah. the like nice algorithm that you're producing. So I get it. This is such a tricky situation, man. And I, I would argue it is finance related too, because mm -hmm. one of the, one of the things up for consideration is that, you know, are they forced to sell to an American company so that we know that the data is held in America and not being used for any sketchy purposes, blah, blah, blah. That's one concept, but it, how do you force a sale of something that is so dominant? I mean, TikTok, yeah. holy crap. It, it's, you know, what is it, 150 million Americans use it. It's used oh, yeah. for several hours a day on average. People people become famous off of it in like short periods of time and make a living off of it. It's, it's going to be really hard to rip this out of the hands of people yeah. and it's not going to be possible to sell it. I don't know how you value something that's the one of the fastest growing apps of all time and is loved by like an entire generation that is, and I don't see where it's going to go. Well, I think it um, was going to be just the American division, like a portion of it, but then how it does that be, even or, organizationally, I'm wondering how that even works. Like, yeah, like they, Hey, sorry, I'm the CEO of the American side. And like, this is where it stops. You know, I'll give you all the analytics and data, but like, we can't give you this stuff. No, maybe. well, if it's, cause if you remember a while ago, there was this weird thing where Oracle bid on it. Mm. Oracle was going to buy TikTok like US. It's it's the US entity, yeah. right? So I think the idea would be um, it is a separately owned entity. There's, there's a different CEO. There are a whole different operation structure. They have their own accounting system. They got their own data centers in the US but here. The same app. That stuff. But I guess the same app. Or perhaps, perhaps what you do is you say, all right, we're going to start with that code base. Now we're each going to mm. iterate and build on this product on our own without talking to each other anymore. And they are genuinely separate, separate companies. Um, <clears throat> That seems like the only way that you know that there's nothing yeah. like nothing going on and nothing's getting back to the CCP, which is the the main concern here. So, yeah, yeah, this is all this is going to be one of the most interesting showdowns in the next like couple of months and heading into the election, because mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people agree the easiest move is to just ban it and we don't have to deal with this stuff sure. anymore. And, you know, our things get banned over there all the time, too. So if you sure. want to go for a tit for tat type thing, that's like that would make sense here. But same time, you got a lot of people are going to be real pissed off if TikTok's taken away from them. So how do, how do you handle like the the um, electability concerns that might come as a result of taking TikTok away from that many people? My recommendation to uh, any TikTok influencers would be start getting your people over to Instagram Reels. Diversify. I <laughs> I agree. If you're totally dependent on TikTok, I would say diversify. It's a it's a low risk, high reward sure. <laughs> move to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I can't wait to watch this play out. This is going to be something else. And as a, as a non TikTok user, I don't yeah. have, uh, I have no skin in this game. So I have to admit, I am, uh, I am opting more into the Instagram reels thing. It's just easier altogether at one point. And so talking about the whole banning thing, the mm -hmm. source is uh, Reuters via the flip side. And this is the news from this past Friday, which is, you, you know, after they had this hearing with the CEO, U.S. lawmakers, uh, they you know, they battered him and then about the potential Chinese influence over the platform and said its short videos were damaging. So it's not only just the security part, too. They said the videos are damaging children's mental health. That's a whole over social media overall as a, yeah. whole, uh, as a whole concept, reflecting bipartisan concerns over the app's power over Americans. So they're influencing people. You can influence children. You can gather information. Again, so this is social media as a whole. Obviously, TikTok is the, the poster child of that. And uh, some 20 U.S. senators, and this is interesting, it's 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans, so it's bipartisan-backed legislation trying to give President Joe Biden uh, administration's path to banning TikTok. There, there's so much interesting about this paragraph. So I find it kind of comical that in the discussion around this, we're willing to um, finally discuss negative things that are a result of any social media platform that's being used, right? So the idea of um, damaging children's mental health we know that happens via Facebook and Instagram already, particularly with teenage girls. That's a big issue. Um, we have bipartisan concerns over the app's power over Americans. We're already well aware that, you know, Facebook was used to influence the election. Twitter is also used for that. Like you can, the social media clearly sways opinion. Like there's no mm -hmm. doubt about that. And 
there's bipartisan agreement on that. You got 10 from each side who share all of those concerns. Just we're only willing to say that out loud because it's TikTok, which is owned by China. Yeah. It's like, and then you're giving away data and it's like, well, do you want to give your data to Facebook or do you want to give it to China? And that is a very different thing. Like I, I would, I would argue, I would much rather have Facebook yeah. own all of our data than have the CCP own all of our data. And right. I think that's a very fair thing to discuss and have some concerns about. Um, but I find it funny how like we're just willing to not talk about any of those other things until we really need to get something done, and then we'll elevate the other issues right. that are results of social media. We need to talk about this more because mm -hmm. yeah, the whole ten second thing, it is crushing people's attention spans. Like re reels, I mean. We were just talking about this recently, right? Just as part of our strategy planning things right. is because of TikTok and Reels, you have under two seconds to grab someone's attention. They just flip like that. And I don't know, social media has been bad enough. Like, can you picture a world where people don't, can't even give you two seconds? Yeah, it's crazy. Can't get like, literally, can I get two seconds of time? No, yeah. you got, you got, statistically, you have 1.5 seconds of my time. If you wow <laughs> me, if you wow me in that one and a half second, then maybe I'll stick around for the next six seconds. It, it's, and it was crazy. I actually read something about how Instagram, um, all the social media apps that have these shorts and these reels were pushing, they're really leaning back into, you know, Vine had it first, which is so funny that yeah. Vine no longer is around because they're pushing people now into like the eight second. It's really prioritizing under 20 second videos. And I experienced that myself. I created a, an Instagram reel that's, it's over 8.5 million views as of today. Why is that? And it was just me sitting here at this podcast table and I just recorded a, a fake podcast talking to nobody. Okay. And it was, I come out with a stat that now suddenly triggers the mind to say, what are you like? What's this guy about to say? He sounds like he's about to say something either really knowledgeable or really ridiculous. I'm I'm validated from a credential standpoint because I'm sitting in front of a microphone and I'm talking to somebody else. So it looks like I could be on Joe Rogan's podcast or something like that. And then it's just a twist at the end that kind of makes your mind be like, huh? And now next thing you know, you're watching it already over again. You're either triggered by it. So you're engaging in the comment section. And that's the part you talk about the mental health stuff mm -hmm. is it's designed to create stimulation that create to force you to engage through usually anger. It's the easiest way. Some people are like, oh, that was a good video. I like it. Somebody's like pissed off at what's in the video. They're, they're commenting and they're like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, all this nonsense. The the algorithm, it's it's brilliant, but it's bad. It's really, it just encourages bad behavior. Ooh, we'll, we we'll, have we'll pull it up. Our producers want us to pull up Drew's video. So we're gonna we're gonna do that in real time here. Give Drew a do little right here. Little plug. Let's go to the wrapping CPA. It is this one right here. So let's take your odds of getting in a plane crash is one in 11 million. Now your odds of breaking 80 is one in 11 trillion. That means you are a million times more likely to get in a plane crash. That's how much you suck at golf. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> so that is, I mean, wait, wait, okay, <laughs> hold on. Like, wait, can you go to the, the first comment with someone correcting you? Or the first one I saw, according to Google, 2% of golfers can break 80. That's one in 50, not one in 11 million. See the difference? I mean, <laughs> the like immediate thing. 28 likes, and there's nine replies on that. Guy needs to go take some basic probability classes. Probably has to ask someone to calculate his 20% tip on the bill. I <laughs> this mean, is it, man. But this is what, like, you, <laughs> I mean, I, I, well done. Well done, this, Drew. The stats on this are absolutely incredible. I mean, it's insane. This thing has gotten... I think it, it's over half a million likes. It's been shared over like 400,000 times. Well, you nailed, uh, you, yeah, the golfers are going to love it. I mean, you're making me feel good. I've broken 83 times. So right. What, how's that? Anyway, so let's get, we'll, we'll keep rolling with that. Let's but keep it's, going. Our producer's going to want us to wrap this up <laughs> soon as well. So Yeah. Um, and so then the fast thing here, this is actually related, and this is a, another concerning thing, right? Uh, JP Morgan Chase thought it had $1.3 million worth of nickel stored in a warehouse. A closer examination revealed bags of stones. This is from the Morning Brew. Yeah. I actually saw our man Blake Oliver uh, over at Earmark share this as well over the weekend. Mm. And uh, yeah, in the middle of a run on the banks and stuff, this, I kind of don't want to see articles like this. So yeah, this is not great that an asset they claim to have backed up by an actual physical asset is not uh, did not exist. I kind of want to just bury my head in the sand and assume this isn't happening with other with other things. Yeah, it's a one-off for, for all that said, what is it really? Why are they holding nickel? I we don't we don't even we don't back our currency with gold. It's not like we don't we don't have a gold reserve like the there's no gold standard anymore. So why in the world are you holding this much nickel? I uh, I guess I didn't even think about the actual stone of nickel. I was almost thinking like I'm wondering if they're just talking about a bunch of nickels. 
But, no, no, I think it's yeah, that's actual actual nickel. Yeah, um, honestly, if they had actual nickel, I would be like, all right, at least they got something, right? It's, it's backing something. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have no idea. Do you imagine what, a, how, a bank heist and they come yeah. in and they go to the back and they go to grab all these bags, they pull them out and then they open it and it's just a yeah, bunch of like, rocks. Give, give me a bunch of rocks. <laughs> these aren't nickel rocks. These are limestone. <laughs> No, nothing's more concerning than banks not being able to count their own inventory. They, yeah, for real, man. <laughs> so this is why concerning. Yeah, this is why inventory checks are very important. Every auditor listening, love that inventory check for real. Mm-hmm. So uh, this final piece, I wanted. I thought you'd get to have an interesting take on this. This is from CPA Trendlines. Uh, is a hot take article why VC is a bigger threat than AI, and the gist of it essentially is that. In private equity, they ultimately are about a return on investment, which means control. And so while AI is something that can be used, they say VCs are a way to control. Now, I don't even, are VCs getting into accounting firms? This or? is, no, I feel like this is going to be very uh, inaccurate, but let's see. So uh, here's some, the article says, here's some truth, at least that I believe. Accountants need to know. Accountants in practice today, particularly firm firm owners, should be more afraid of venture capital entering the profession than AI or any like form of automation. A bold statement, I know, but stay with me if you agree. And we don't have the rest of the article. So I have I have part of it here. Yeah, which yeah, is, you want to, yeah. Just give me the overview yeah. here. Yeah. In short, all chat GPT, this is what he wrote. In short, all chat GPT and the rest of bots out there is offer another level of automation, which they still need uh, the professional human to reap its full benefits. True. This is all despite the potential for things going wrong, as with most technology, but not to the degree that venture capital and private equity will. In private equity, they ultimately care about return on investment, which means control. They sit on the company's board or enter the C-suite of a business to help control its path, its decisions, and its future. To me, this is something that the accounting profession has seen little of over the years and with good reason. So I guess he seems to believe that VCs will or are getting involved in accounting firms or impacting regulations and standards from like the top down, whereas, you know, Typically, when it comes to automation, you kind of start to incorporate it into your workflow, and then it's an overall mm-hmm. industry impact. This seems to be either VCs lobbying for accounting terms or VCs literally buying accounting firms. I, the, the whole thing here is like I don't think they're – it's not like there's a scalable profitability that comes with accounting firms. Yeah, there. there's – so what I've seen is in in our time founding Flowcast, there have been a couple of these that cycled out. So um, someone will start a – CPA firm, you know, they'll provide bookkeeping services. So small businesses is generally what it is. So a CAS firm, uh, client accounting services, um, they might want to expand rapidly and they might go raise money from venture capitalists. And what I saw was their pitch would be, hey, we've hired these people, we have these clients and we're using XYZ technology stack, or we've built this piece of technology to automate a lot of this work. Therefore, we're going to be able to do this more profitably than your traditional bookkeeping firm give us some money so we can go hire more people get more clients. Uh, some of them go out and do acquisition strategies where they'll buy a bunch of bookkeeping firms, combine them, and then put them on the technology stack and become more profitable. So that's what VCs are investing in is this like, it's called software enabled services. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like, it's a service, but they're saying it's cheaper because there's so much software behind it. Some, some VCs actually lost a lot of money in that game, like in the 2000... 16, 17-ish time frame. One, one company in particular, I don't want to talk about him, but they completely blew up because it was just like they were way overselling what they were doing and all this kind of stuff. That's different though. I wouldn't say like people, like venture capital is investing in new firms. I don't think that's going to destroy accounting or is a bigger threat than AI. Yeah. And quite frankly, them investing in the AI is probably like what's going to do it. Um, them sitting on private equity, people sitting on boards doesn't really concern me either. I don't understand what the yeah. what the issue is here. And if it's that people are impacting legislation and you know guidance or anything like that, um, VCs and private equity people are the least, the last ones you should worry about. You should worry about the hedge funds and people who sit on like publicly public company boards, not people who are sitting on privately traded pri- private equity companies. Yeah. Like like wor- worry about you know yeah the big ones. I don't want to yeah. name any names. But but, worry about worry about the big ones. <laughs> yeah, the ones that want to manipulate it for their own uh, benefit, yeah. the little Enron folks. Yeah. So let's uh, we'll fly through this. How should we account for memes round? Man, VCs um, are so hated right now. It's they're it, they're taking hits. Yeah, you know? they're uh, it's like, you know, you had the robber barons of the nineteen nineteen like nineteen teens or the twenties and stuff. Or tech people seem to be the robber barons of this <laughs> day and age, and it's it's kind of sad how misunderstood VC is yeah. and and how how quite frankly screwed we would be if that didn't exist. It, it bugs me. It bugs me. We have to uh, elevate VCs. That's the next series. We'll talk about the VC. I'll one. tell you this. We wouldn't be hosting a podcast. Nobody would. If <laughs> yeah, I would not have a job. We would not have jobs. No. <laughs> this is nuts. Uh, so, so how should we account for memes? 
Uh, not a crazy lot happening actually over the last two weeks, probably because everybody was consumed by SVB and and also a lot of creators are in the middle of busy season themselves. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, see what we got. That's a good point. But this is uh, this is an interesting one here. This is from this is actually one that was posted on Reddit from Value Counts. Shout out to Value Counts. <laughs> And this mm -hmm. is again, banks also taken a lot of a lot of slack lately, but I think kind of rightly so. So <laughs> we've got here uh, Bart Simpson telescope really digging deep down. Banks, when you're overdrawn account, when you overdraw your account by three dollars, they're they're in there, they're scrutinizing it. Same image, banks evaluating you for a two thousand dollar credit limit. You know, it's like, oh, well, dude, can you really afford to pay us back that? And then <laughs> and then we got a picture of Bart Simpson blind, like a three blind mice style. Banks evaluating their own hundred billion dollar bond portfolio. This is a direct stab at SVB. <laughs> yes, it is. It's accurate. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> uh, I mean, same thing with their own inventory. Apparently, uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you're doing. One point. I mean, one point three is immaterial for them. I will. I yeah. will give them credit yeah. for it is that. Immaterial. Hundred billion, very material <laughs> for a bank of that size, yeah. dude. Yeah, this is only funny because it's true. And I mean, it's. Uh, I. I it's so obviously he's blind in this uh, in this reference. I would almost view it as more like putting your burying your head in the sand. Like yeah. they, they weren't unaware that this was an issue. It's just like how do we get out from this and let's ignore it and yeah. all that kind of stuff. It's just and, one of those yeah. things that questions like where are the priorities? It's like rather than you know everybody gets scrutinized on the. It's always the little guy that's getting screwed right over the three dollar overdraw or the two thousand dollar credit limit. But then you got a hundred billion dollars that's just exposed mm -hmm. and at risk. So. Yeah, but our bank's taking slack, so we'll see. We'll see what kind of happens with these changes. Well, here's the <clears throat> so here's an interesting thought: is um, if like F, so, if FDIC didn't exist, or if we decided to not back it up, these are the kinds of fees that would actually increase. Mm. And are people getting more annoyed if there's a higher overdraft fee, or if your True. credit limit goes down, things like that? So the, it's an interesting. Even within this meme, there's some nuance to mm. thinking about the whole the whole thing. There's, um, there's always more than meets the meme. But yeah, how in the world? Do you not know what's going on with a $100 billion bond portfolio? Well, yeah. So then uh, last one we have on here, this is from the big four. There should only be one depreciation method. That is the straight line method. And I think the, the, the interesting theme, I think, over the course of this whole entire episode has just been like accounting standard updates and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, has have things gotten too complex? Have they gotten more complex than they need to be? Perhaps some things deserve to be simplified a little bit. Could could not agree more. I I actually agree with this one. I'm really I'm really yeah. curious what, like yeah. At what point is is it good is good enough good enough? But yeah, man. Like in terms of complexity, talking back to the NFTs, that that is going to get mm. hyper complex. And does I'm sure we do need double declining balance yeah. for some reason or something. Sure. But uh, I do love a good old straight line, and it's what I've used for 99 percent of my career. I, I I agree that it should be one of those things. I mean, I guess I do see, I do see how you know, when you have that exponential, it's something that very quickly loses value, you, it would lose What do you even value. use that for? Like a car feels like a fair thing. Yeah, it seems like. Well, I don't know. Not in this economy when real when used cars are worth more than right? <laughs> new cars now. I, you know, I, I mean, there's definitely pieces <laughs> of technology that are like very valuable, you know, not as valuable the next year, but within three years, it's going to be almost negligent because the next one comes out like a phone maybe, right? Where the, the next year you could still get good dollar for it, but it is used. So it's still the same item. It's still the most up-to-date model, but it's used. Mm -hmm. After it's no longer considered used, it's now just outdated. And there's something else that's newer. So then it further exponentially decreases the value of it. That's where I could see it. Again, a lot of these things I think start with good intentions and then they end up getting too convoluted because we should not be using accounting as a way to manipulate how things are perceived or how we can kind of get away with stuff. And that seems mm -hmm. to be what happens, right? Like you can do that with a house where you can depreciate the value of your house. That way you can avoid paying the taxes, right? And it's just using accounting standards in a way they're not designed to be used for personal gain. And it, it's set up with a good intention and there's a reason for it. Yeah. But it, it, you can't just make, you can't write a rule for every little exception. So you can use the double declining method, but not in these scenarios. And then somebody else uses it for another one and not in that one. And then another, and then not in that one, it would just go on forever. Yeah. That's uh, why accounting guidance isn't all that far from legal yeah. <laughs> guidance, right? If, yeah. It's, but it, to your point, I think it happens naturally if with good intentions, <clears throat> figure out a use case or some, mm -hmm. some specific thing that happens and we need to adjust guidance. And then, yeah, it can be abused in other ways because it's so complex. Yeah. But fascinating questions. I, I do like straight line. Yeah. So I, I'm all for simplification wherever possible. So, 
This has been a this has been a mouthful of an episode, but uh, I'm glad we got through it all. And this is a, a, honestly the most exciting accounting stuff that I think's happened in the industry in in quite some time. <laughs> yeah, we got to focus on some some nerdy stuff today around guidance with uh, with very detailed topics, and I think that's going to result in. Some meme in the future where it's like, I only want one intangible valuation method <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's going to be this one. So we'll, we'll see how that plays That's out. That's true. So, I mean, I would say that this week, the last couple of weeks, this is a huge elevation for accounting. I mean, you, you got the FASB getting together, putting out new standards, exposure drafts. I mean, these are all really good things. And what's, what's one man's, I don't even know what the right term, I'm not talking about one man's trash, but what's somebody else's fault is another one's opportunity. And in this case, the, the bank's. And whether the VC is taking slack, uh, crypto being unregulated, all these things offers this great opportunity for accountants to, again, step in and create the regulations that need to be done, be recognized for the importance of having auditors, of mm -hmm. having competent accountants that know what they're doing and not just control seeing and control being their way through life. Yep. I think it's a it's a it's definitely an uplift. It's been nice seeing in the as I've been reading more of the coverage of the banks and everything, it, it is there's a lot more accounting talk going on and they're talking about a guidance and mark to market terms mm -hmm. are being used. It's like, people are actually learning about this a little, a little bit. Not, yeah. not, I don't think your average you know person is in mark to market accounting, but at least within the business world, like people are diving into accounting a little bit more and are like, wait, that's how it works. That's why it works. Really? Why do they do it that way? And yeah. it's like fair, but yeah, I'm glad people are paying attention to a little bit more and can appreciate accounting. And yeah. even if they think it's dumb in this instance, which I, I agree with, <laughs> uh, you understand the importance of it. So it's been cool to see just like, yeah, the, Talk about accounting. Yeah, and in my personal life as well, just people have been curious and there's more people reaching out. I did the TLDR episode on uh, just the quick breakdown of it and people like, that was so helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really cool, like you said, people genuinely interested, makes us feel good as accountants. We could be proud to be proud to be accountants and I think everybody out there should be proud to be one as well. Agreed. So that's uh, this has been a great episode. Great talking to you on uh, the FinTech flow. This is... Uh, that's a wrap on this and we'll see you guys next week. Awesome. Or in a couple weeks. Good stuff, Drew. Enjoyed, enjoyed chatting again. Thanks yeah, everybody. Absolutely. Every time. <laughs>